Hi there everybody, this video is looking at the structure of proteins. So a protein is a polymer, which means it's uh, very, uh, made of lots of repeating units which are the same type of molecule. So amino acids are the monomers which make up the polymer of a protein. Uh, we can also say that proteins are a macromolecule because they're very big. So the structure of a protein looks a bit like this. Um, first of all, you have a central carbon, and that carbon is attached on one side to this NH2 group, and that's what we call the amino group. And then on the other side of that central carbon, we've got COOH, which is called our carboxyl group. The central carbon then also has two more bonds to make. It has hydrogen and it has something called the R group. Now there are um, just over 20 different amino acids and this part here is exactly the same on all amino acids. The R group is the part of the amino acid structure which differs from one amino acid to the next um, and it's this R group which helps to give each amino acid its unique properties. So the R group can be as simple as an H Okay, so there is an amino acid which just has a single H atom as its R group. It could be CH3, so another amino acid has this as its R group, but it could also be quite a lot more complex. Some amino acids have ring structures as their R group. You don't need to know what they all are, you just need to be aware that they are different and that we just call it the R group. Okay, so peptide bonds. Peptide bonds are, is the name of the bonds that join two amino acids together. So if we have one amino acid here, and then we have another one over here, and we want to join them, they will join together using a peptide bond, and they will make a dipeptide, because we would have two of them. So this is how a peptide bond is formed. First of all, these uh, atoms here, so the, uh, the a hydroxyl group from one amino acid and a hydrogen from the amino group of the other amino acid are going to be removed. And therefore the carbon and the nitrogen form a bond. Now, because we've removed an OH and an H, that means that we're removing water. And what that means is that this is a condensation reaction. Uh, if we just tidy this up a little bit, Okay, so we'll just draw it out again. Then we can draw it like this. Okay, so this bit here, this is our peptide bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. We now have our dipeptide. Okay, so the opposite of the formation of a peptide bond is the hydrolysis of the peptide bond. So that's where we have uh, two amino acids joined together by a peptide bond and we want to break it apart. So it's just the opposite. So if we add water, so therefore it's a hydrolysis reaction, so lysis splitting hydro with water. So we're going to add in um, two H's and an O. The OH goes on one, the H goes on the other, and now we have our two amino acids back where we started. So um, that formation and hydrolysis of peptide bond, we've just shown two amino acids coming together. Um, but of course, if you want to make a polypeptide, which is lots and lots of amino acids joined together in a row, just means you have to do it many times. So if each of these represents a single amino acid, then to make a polypeptide, all you have to do is have lots of different condensation reactions. So each condensation reaction forms a peptide bond Water, a, water, a water molecule is removed, and then you'll end up with your polypeptide. Okay, so we need to talk about the different levels of structure in a protein. So if we have a polypeptide chain, and we know that there are lots of different amino acids. So here's an example of a sequence. Now polypeptides would be longer than this. This is just seven amino acids long, but this is just an example. So here we can see lots of amino acids. Now, there are, each amino acid has a three-letter code. Uh, you don't need to know what they are, but you can see that we've got a particular sequence. 
the sequence of amino acids in the polypeptide chain is what we call the primary structure. And it's very important because if you have a different primary structure, that means you have a different sequence of amino acids, that will then affect the secondary structure, the tertiary structure, and it will therefore affect the properties and therefore the function of that protein. Okay, so it all starts with our sequence of amino acids. It all starts with our primary structure. Okay, so the secondary structure is what you get when you start to in, uh, take that primary structure, you take that polypeptide chain, um, and it starts to form some bonds. So what you can see here, if we imagine that this is our polypeptide chain, um, instead of just staying like as a straight chain, what it can do is it can form a shape like this. So this is a helix. So if we just draw it out again, so here's our helix. And what you can see here, let me just go back a bit. If we imagine that this helix is, of course, made of um, lots of amino acids all joined together. So what we can see is that as we go down, um, the carboxyl group here, there's an oxygen sticking up there. We've got the nitrogen sticking out there, the carboxyl group of the oxygen sticking up there. And what that means is we can have hydrogen bonds. So the hydrogen bond from the amino group of one amino acid is formed with the oxygen of the carboxyl group of another amino acid further down in the chain. So what we do is we get these hydrogen bonds all the way down. And that forms a very regular helix, which we call the alpha helix. So the alpha helix is a particular shape as a coiling of the polypeptide chain held together by hydrogen bonds and that is one um, example of secondary structure. Our polypeptide chain can form another secondary structure. Um, again here is our chain so if you imagine we've got here here's one part of our chain and then here is another part of the chain so it's just kind of like you know as if it's looped around. And again, you can see that we've got hydrogen bonds between hydrogens and oxygens of different amino acids. So what those hydrogen bonds is doing is it's holding two parallel parts of the polypeptide together. And it actually forms a particular shape. It forms this sort of um, zigzagged shape, if you like. And here are the hydrogen bonds. So this is one polypeptide chain. And this is the other bit of the same polypeptide chain. It's the same chain though, okay, it's not two chains, it's one chain, um, which has just sort of come up here, folded around, and then come down here. And this secondary structure is called a beta pleated sheet. So if you have a really long polypeptide chain, you might have parts of that polypeptide chain which show an alpha helix structure, and parts of the polypeptide chain might show a beta pleated sheet structure. And there might be some parts which don't have either of those. It's just a straight chain. OK, so tertiary structure, tertiary meaning third. What this shows is the polypeptide chain all folded up and coiled up into a three dimensional shape. Now, you still have your primary and secondary structure. You've obviously still got the primary structure. That's just a sequence of amino acids. Some parts of the polypeptide still show the secondary structure, which is here in alpha, alpha helix. Maybe that bit there is showing a bit of beta pleated sheet structure. We've got a bit of alpha helix there and so on. Hang on, so I want to go back a bit. So we've got a secondary structure but then the whole polypeptide has folded and coiled up to make this 3D structure. And you have to have bonds holding that structure in place. So this is not just a random sort of tangling of the polypeptide chain. This particular shape, so this 3D structure is there because of the bonds which are involved. And the bonds are there because of the amino acids which are in different places. So for example, if I use these purple dots to represent places in the polypeptide chain, 
where there is a particular amino acid. Um, and this amino acid is cysteine. So the R group for cysteine is sulfur. It's not just a sulfur atom. Um, it's, it's more than that. But the important part is in the R group, there is a sulfur atom. So in our polypeptide chain, in this example, we've got cysteine amino acids in all of these places, okay, which means that they all have sulfur. Now, if you have two cysteine atoms um, quite close to one another, what you can get is a bond forming between the sulfurs, and we call that a disulfide bridge. So in our example over here, we could get disulfide bridges forming. Oh, I've gone too fast again, sorry. We can get disulfide bridges forming here and here. And those disulfide bridges are covalent bonds and they're very, very strong. So it helps to keep it in place. There are other bonds as well that can help keep our tertiary structure in place. So we're using green to represent um, another kind of amino acid. Um, and this amino acid, it doesn't represent just one single amino acid but there are quite a few amino acids, um, and those amino acids, as their R group, um, they have a, a negative charge on their R group. And there are other amino acids, so several of them, which have got a positive charge on their R group. And as you can see here, what that means is you end up with a bond between the positive uh, charge and the negative charge on those groups. Um, and they are ionic bonds, okay? So these are ionic bonds, um, and I said positive and negative groups. It's actually this, what we see here, this bit here, this is the uh, amino group of an amino acid, but it's amino, an amino group that's not involved in any of the peptide bonds. And here we've got the carboxyl group of another amino acid, but it's not involved in any uh, peptide bonds. So we can get ionic bonds here. Now they are also strong. They are not as strong as the disulfide bonds. Um, or disulfide bridges and if you change the pH for example then you could break those ionic bonds the other thing that helps to keep the structure is something called hydrophobic interactions um, and that's because some of the amino acids that are groups um, are polar and some of the amino acids are nonpolar so the nonpolar R groups because they are nonpolar, they have no charge, they will repel water. So nonpolar R groups repel water, and therefore you get that hydrophobic interaction. And that tends to help to fold up the polypeptide so that any hydrophobic R groups are on the inside of the protein. Because these proteins will tend to be in the cell or they might be in like the bloodstream. So there will be a, some sort of watery environment and the hydrophobic R groups will arrange themselves so they're as far away from possible as possible from the outside. Okay, the last structure to think about is quaternary structure. Okay, so let me actually, sorry, I'm going to go back a little bit. What you can see here, this is our polypeptide chain, and you can see that the polypeptide chain has been folded and coiled into its tertiary structure. Quaternary structure is just any protein which has more than one polypeptide chain. So there is another polypeptide chain folded and coiled, but the two of them, these both of these two polypeptide chains are connected together. So because there are two of them, they're connected together, this thing, this is the whole protein, so the whole protein here consists of two polypeptide chains it has a quaternary structure. Sometimes, if you've got a protein with a quaternary structure, um, there is also something, they also have a prosthetic group. So these green bits here represent the prosthetic group, and that's just something which is not a protein, but it is something which is attached to the molecules in some way um, and helps as part of its structure. So hemoglobin is an example. So hemoglobin is a protein, it has a quaternary structure, and it has iron groups attached to the polypeptide chains. So the iron groups, which are called heme groups, are the prosthetic groups in hemoglobin.
Okay, that's all. I think just to finish, just the one thing I want to say is that um, the bonding is the most important thing. Um, everything to do with protein function is a result of the structure and the different levels of structure. And therefore it's because of the bonding. So if something happens to alter the bonding in a protein, it will alter the structure and therefore it will alter, alter the function. And it could mean that the protein is unable to function in the correct way. Okay, thank you.